Tonight on KGW News, less punishment and in theory, more treatment. This would not be here today without ballot measure 110. Nearly three years on, the first detox center funded by that measure has now opened up. Also ahead, cash plus an apology. How much Portland will pay to the former city commissioner falsely accused of a hit and run. Then tragedy for an orca that spent five decades in captivity and was finally about to be released into the wild. Nobody saw it coming. And later. It's very heartwarming to see all these people come together to help the people and pets of Maui. Special delivery at PDX, where these cats and kittens displaced by the Maui wildfires are headed next. Good evening, everyone. We begin with two major natural disasters we are tracking, which could impact our weather and air and quality right here in the Northwest in the coming days. First, the worst wildfire season in Canadian history. One of the latest blazes in British Columbia's Okanagan has mushroomed in size in the last 24 hours. According to the CBC, evacuation orders in and around the city of Kelowna grew from 4,500 people to 15,000 in just an hour. Incredible pictures here. That blaze, which authorities say has already destroyed structures, is expected to send smoke our way. And we are also tracking what could be a history making Hurricane Hillary, a category for churning off Mexico's Pacific coast. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Matt Safino. Matt, let us start with the smoke. What is the forecast looking like? You know, it is going to get smoky and hazy here in the west side of the Cascades over the weekend. The question is, will that smoke surface, meaning will it come from aloft and get down low where it decreases our air quality and gets in your lungs and eyes and makes it just miserable to be outside? We're good right now. 64 degrees. Air quality is excellent. It's a clear sky. But look at the satellite imagery and you can see the fires burning up here in the Okanagan and that smoke initially getting blown on off to the east. But now more northerly winds are going to begin to settle on in. That's going to fill the Columbia Basin with smoke. There are also fires in Spokane County and up in the uh, Idaho Panhandle too. They've had a lot of smoke up there and that's all going to fill in and then funnel down through the Columbia Basin and eventually over here west of the Cascades because we're going to pick up just some very light east winds. I think a lot of this smoke will end up staying a lot, but some of it may mix down to the surface, so I'll have to keep close eyes on that. But right now our air quality is excellent here. It's good down in southern Oregon as well. As well. We're not getting any reports out of Sisters and Bend, but it's been smoky there because of the fires in the Willamette National Forest. So look at the smoke model here, and you see this plume of red and orange moving into the metro area at about 10 10 30 in the morning, right? So that's why we're expecting smoke this weekend. Now on to Hurricane Hillary still churning and burning off the coast of Cabo about 900 miles south of Cabo San Lucas right now. The track will continue to let it roll up north towards Southern California, and we've got a couple of things going on down there that are really just remarkable. First of all, look at this making landfall around Tijuana potentially still is a hurricane. Whether it's a hurricane or a tropical storm won't matter. The impacts will continue through Sunday. It's still a tropical storm as far inland as Barstow, California, as we go into Sunday, Sunday night, and still a tropical storm crossing the Sierra Nevada, and then finally deteriorating as it moves farther north. Now, look at the rainfall forecast with this. Even in Oregon, upwards of an inch and maybe several inches as you go on over into Idaho. So we could have flash flood issues in parts of eastern Oregon. The forecast of rain in southern California, five plus inches down there. So it really is quite remarkable. So first tropical storm warning ever for southern California. Also first time they've been in the high risk area on the excessive rainfall outlook. And oh yeah, tornadoes also possible in southern California on Sunday. A lot to deal with down there, David. So much to keep an eye on. Thank you, Matt. See you in a few. Let's get you caught up on tonight's other headlines. Now, a fourth person has now died from suspected heat related causes in the city of Portland. Multnomah County says the latest victim was found Thursday in northeast Portland when the temperature was 92. The three other deaths were earlier in the week with temperatures in the triple digits. In all four cases, the medical examiner will still need to officially confirm a cause of death. Former City Commissioner Joe Ann Hardesty has agreed to settle a lawsuit against the city of Portland. This is over a 2021 case where she was falsely accused in a hit and run. A witness told dispatchers they thought Hardesty was driving the car that crashed. Police later determined she was not involved, but her lawsuit claimed the former head of the police union leaked the allegation to reporters and political opponents before her name was cleared. She sued the city police union, the former union head and an officer. Today's settlement for $5,000 is just from the city and included a letter of apology from the mayor 
Artisty's case against the other defendants, including the Portland Police Association, continues. It's set for trial next month. And we have a major road closure to tell you about this week. On the northbound side, the interstate bridge will shut tomorrow night, then again on Sunday night for deck repairs. That is all northbound lanes of I-5 over the Columbia starting at 10 p.m. Saturday to 6 a.m. Sunday, and again from 10 p.m. Sunday until 5 a.m. Monday. The Hayden Island on-ramp to northbound I-5 will also close. I-205 there, your best alternate. Developing this evening, the search for a killer who assaulted then gunned down a 26 year old man walking in a North Portland park. Alma McCarty is in the newsroom. Alma, it's been a year this week since that murder, and now authorities are announcing a reward. David, although they declined to go on camera, friends of Adrian Perdomo tell me it's been a very difficult year. They're still heartbroken, hoping and praying that someone will come forward. August 14th, 2022. 26-year-old Adrian Perdomo was walking through Northgate Park in the Portsmouth neighborhood. It was about 10 o'clock at night. We believe that he was assaulted by several individuals and then murdered. A friend of Perdomo's told us it happened so fast, and though they ran over to him, they couldn't save him. Officers found several shell casings at the scene near the victim. But this is where we are at this point, is we're a year after the murder, happened. We're still working on leads. We're trying to drum up more information and get more community involvement. Matthew Schlegel is the assistant special agent in charge of Portland's FBI field office. We have no reason why that he was a target other than the fact that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But that shouldn't be a cause for murder or for assault or anything else. But what is the wrong place? You should be able to walk through any Portland park at any time of day, let alone at 10, which is relatively early. Um, and walk safely amongst your neighborhood and your community. Portland police came to the FBI for help with this case since they strongly believe there were several witnesses who either heard the shots or saw something out their window. Investigators now imploring anyone with information to come forward, understanding that some may be reluctant. We're hoping to incentivize anybody who may have seen or heard something to call our tip line due to the fact that we're offering a $15,000 reward. Now you can call the field office. We have that number on KGW.com or you can submit a tip online at tips.fbi.gov. David. Thanks, Alma. I appreciate your reporting tonight. We are learning more tonight about the 37 year old man now in a Washington County jail accused of sexually assaulting single moms and their young daughters. The details here are quite disturbing. Authorities say Antonio Arredondo abused the 10 year old daughter of a woman he met online. They say he did the same thing three other times to young girls in Washington, Multnomah and Polk counties after allegedly meeting their moms on Facebook. Authorities say one of the victims is as young as four. Another is severely hearing impaired. This person is a, a, without a doubt they're a danger to the community, not just Washington County all over. Um, we want to we want this information to spread. Um, we're concerned that this isn't just an Oregon problem. Arredondo is a registered sex offender out of Texas, where he was convicted of sexually assaulting the nine-year-old sister of a friend. Anyone with information about Arredondo is urged to contact authorities. Tonight, a new tool to help in Oregon's opioid crisis is opening in southeast Portland. It is the first detox facility state funded through Measure 110. And while the need is so great, it also raises the question of how many people the center will actually be able to help. Pat Doris took a closer look tonight on the story. Measure 110 has been controversial, with some saying it's enabling drug use and is to blame for the fentanyl crisis we now see on our streets. Others argue it just needs to be given time to work. So, have we turned a corner with this new facility and others on the way? We certainly know any additional detox beds are helpful. Those who want to get clean often cannot get help when they're ready for it. This new center in a remodeled home in southeast Portland will open its doors in September. It'll be the third detox facility in Portland accepting people on the Oregon Health Plan. But unlike the larger centers, this one will not take walk-ins. And the beds will be reserved for those addicted to specific substances, including fentanyl and alcohol. It will also include just 16 detox beds where people can stay three to five days. One man who's been through detox himself worries that something like this won't really make much of a difference. 16 beds, I'm laughing at 16 beds. Look, look down this street right here. Look down that street right there. I bet you half of them are 
hooked on opiates right now. If half of us went in there, that's 30 people right there. How, what's 16 beds gonna do? Like, that wait list is gonna be years long. And we need more. We, ex we already anticipate wait lists, even at this facility. So more beds is just a benefit for our community. There are more beds on the way. Recovery Works Northwest, which is running the new facility, plans to open another Measure 110 funded detox facility in Milwaukee by the end of the year. One of the issues slowing things down, the money for Measure 110 has been slow to roll out. Recovery Works says it took two years for them to get the $2 million needed to open the Southeast Portland Center. Our thanks to Pat and team for looking into that. For more in-depth looks at the big issues in our community, you can check out The Story that's every weekday at 630, only here on KGW.